Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. This is Real Science Radio. I'm Fred Williams. And I'm Doug McBurney, Bible student and amateur comedian. Fred, it's great to be back talking about real science on Friday. So, Doug, we're actually back for our show on abiogenesis part two. We had Dr. Royal Truman on air last week, and we got into a lot of really good chemistry stuff and just the, some of the philosophy behind the whole question of the origin of life. So I'd like to welcome back to Real Science Radio, Dr. Royal Truman. Super glad to be back again. I really enjoy discussing these things. Yes, yes. And uh, I'll just remind everyone, Dr. Truman has a bachelor's in chemistry and computer science from SUNY Buffalo, an MBA from the University of Michigan, and a PhD in organic chemistry from Michigan State. And now I want to get back into the discussion. We were getting to just barely getting to the chemicals. And now take us into the chemicals and then let's go beyond, Dr. Truman. Okay, what I thought I'd do uh, this time is share some very fundamental uh, chemical principles. You have to understand that uh, chemists have a vast toolbox of, of techniques and tools to force chemical reactions to do what we want them to do, mm -hmm. okay? That's why you can look around anywhere in your room, look at your clothes, look at the paint on the walls, look at the varnish on the floor, everything's been touched by chemists. So we know what things bring together under what conditions to produce airplanes and computers and toys, and stuff like that. We know these things. These skills are brought into play when people try to explain the infrastructure, the chemical infrastructure, which is necessary to life to be possible. You look at the components of cells, like amino acids, DNA, the sugars, lipids, um, things like that. And you, the chemists try to retroengineer, okay, how would I go about creating that particular chemical structure? What temperatures, what catalysts, what components, how much time would I need, what temperatures, what solvents? And step by step, the origin of life, people, they do what we would do normally in chemistry. They plan, they design a series of steps to achieve an outcome. Ah, so and they design. I heard the word design in there. It's not natural. Exactly. Uh, without design, you cannot achieve anything of any interest worth publishing in origin of life research. Everything has been very, very carefully thought out, usually after years and years of preparation, experimentation, to get some kind of an outcome you want. So with that background, I thought I would share just a few very simple principles to help understand a little bit uh, how this research works and how to help interpret uh, papers when you read them. So we have to look at some chemical realities. One is... To get a chemical outcome, you've got to have the correct out a combination and proportion of the right chemicals together at the same time, okay? Ideally, uh, as pure as possible. Um, if you don't, you end up with a mess. So everybody yeah. knows in, who's working in a laboratory that you leave almost any pot with any kind of chemicals in it around for a few days, and you get gunk at the bottom, yellow, mm gunk, okay? You get all kinds of strange um, things going on that you don't want through unguided uh, reactions. Uh -huh. So yeah. you've got unguided. to have deep expertise to guide, to guide the outcome. So, I mean, you, you've got a background in engineering. Think about it. If you want to manufacture something, you've got molds, you've got pulleys, you've got things that bring components together the right components, in the right order, in the right manner, the components must mesh together and you are guiding an outcome, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, there's the, the, party, the infrastructure is so important. The infrastructure. And this is what chemists can do very, very, very well. We know that it's good to stir uh, the chemicals in the solvent to bring them together. We know that... At, certain temperatures, we're going to end up getting all kinds of junk. So at the right time, we purify 
the intermediate steps. We know all the different ways to purify the intermediate steps. We know their result when we do that. So what we're doing is we are avoiding the wrong outcome. It's like pushing a robot through a maze. Hmm. You know, we know how to get to where we want to get. We know how to push the robot. And so we're driving the chemistry in the way we want. And that is what abiogenesis has to do. Yeah. They have to appeal to an engineering component to do what they claim isn't engineering, isn't engineered. That's right. And so what is interesting here, and this is where I'm hoping now to, to provide some insights, and that's the, the following. Typically, in origin of life research, you have a bunch of incompatible effects. What that means is, if you try to get a particular kind of compound, it has to meet many properties. Let me give an example. Let's say that you want to create proteins. And before you get proteins, let's say you get something smaller, we'll just call these peptides, like larger and larger and larger peptides until you get a protein. And peptides are made out of amino acids. Here's the problem. And here's why you have so many theories. The, these peptides have to meet many, many requirements simultaneously. So what's happening is researchers are looking at one of the many, many requirements, one of them, and they're saying, hmm, that's pretty tough. And then they are coming up with a scenario environment to satisfy that property. But the problem is these properties that have to be set aside mutually are incompatible together. That's why you've got, like we saw last week, one theory that said hydrothermal vents. Why? Because they're trying to solve one problem specifically to create longer and longer and longer peptides. They want to solve that using heat. Another one is coming up with another hypothesis that says under ice. Why? Because He's trying to solve a different problem. He's trying to solve the problem of racemization of amino acids. What wow. I'm trying to, to clarify is that these are incompatible requirements. When you focus on one, you're screwing up the others. Yeah, yeah. that's perfectly yeah. clear. It's perfectly <laughs> clear, doctor. Thank you. So let me let me give you five requirements that proteins have to meet. I'm writing a paper right now with other chemist, and actually there are 10 requirements, okay? But we'll just keep it down to five for today. Five requirements, and I'll show you how these requirements are mutually incompatible. And that's the problem we've got with origin of life. Here's the first one. The amino acids come in two flavors, the left-handed and the mm -hmm. right-handed, L and D, right? And we want only the L form to be present. So that's the first problem is we want only peptides, only proteins to form based on the L amino acid only. Now, yeah. this is a bigger problem than one thinks because people have spent their whole careers trying to find ways to get a little bit of excess of let's say the L form using many many uh, chemical tricks. I won't get. I won't go through that today. Okay. However, even if you get more L, the problem is it converts to the other, and it converts even faster once they have polymerized into peptides. That means if you have two different amino acids alone like salts alone, they interconvert fairly slowly. But the moment they have condensed together to form long chains, this process is much, much, much faster. So now you've got a huge problem. If you want life to develop over millions of years, these things are racemizing. You're not getting the long L peptide chains at all you're getting so, so the they're when you say racemizing they're going back right. from what was all else they're going back to half and half at 50 percent exactly. l's and d's yeah and so what does the design of life requires them to be all else 
without That's correct, life. Because yeah. Otherwise, you don't get the proteins able to form the three dimensional uh, consistent structures to then provide, you know, enzymatic and, and structural properties that are necessary. Yeah. So, they break down yeah. back into L5050. That'd be bad. Yes. So, like I said, there are five properties that I want to go through today as quickly as possible. And the first one is you need to form peptides that only have the L form. That's the one. Here's the second one. You need the uh, amino acids to link together in a linear chain, end-to-end -end linear chain. The problem is the same functional groups, specifically an amino group and a carboxyl acid group that condense together to, to form the peptide by excluding, by spitting out water and forming a peptide bond. Those functional groups, carboxylic acid and, and amino groups, are very often found in other places also of the same amino acids. So you can get the reaction occurring in, in the wrong places. Ah. And that's a disaster. Yeah. That means that the chain will start building in this direction and in another direction simultaneously. And you know, what a lot of people have overlooked, a lot of chemists, the longer your linear chain, the more side branch positions you're now creating to mess up and hinder longer chains of forming. Mm. Yeah, and if you're watching this on YouTube, we've got the slide up showing the right direction and where these side chains can would be wrong. This is interesting. It's like you, we spoke of requirements. This is required to link a certain way for life to work. That's the requirement number two, that the end groups of the amino acids only must react to form these peptides. Now, requirement number three, these peptides have got to be very long. A protein that's got two, three amino acids is not a protein. It can't do anything. It requires very, very elaborate, complex, three-dimensional structures to do all the things proteins have to do. So typically, you've got hundreds or thousands, depending on the protein, of amino acids that have got to link together. Now, the problem we've got here is that this is thermodynamically very, very unfavorable. That means that by reacting to amino acids together, it's called to condense them together, uh, in water, it quickly favors going in the wrong direction, back to the amino acid direction. Mm. So the longer the peptide is, the easier it is to break and go down to smaller and smaller peptides. Yes, and especially, like you said, in the presence of water, a solvent. Right. Typically, if you have a temperature about 25 degrees, you got to figure that a small peptide adding one more amino acid alone is so unfavorable that if you let this happen for a long period of time, you have a ratio of about a million to one of the shorter one. And that's true for every amino acid you add. So the proportion, the proportion of the longer peptides in water is like negligible. So that's requirement number three these uh, amino acids have to form long chain. Yeah. And yeah. the cards are stacked against them from the beginning. That's correct. One reason they're stacked against them it brings up to number four, and that is the amino acids must only uh, react with other amino acids to form these peptides. And the problem is you've got many, many other kinds of chemicals that could also react, including other kinds of amino acids that are not the kinds needed for biology. Uh, in biology, we have 20 um, fundamental amino acids. These are called alpha amino acids because of where the side chain is located. They're, they're also beta and gamma amino acids. There are many, many substances that uh, contain a carboxyl uh, group, and there are many uh, substances that contain an amino group. And all these things could interfere with the necessary reaction to form nice, clean, linear peptides. Yeah. And the fact that we get nice, clean, linear peptides is, uh, again, appealing back to design. They're trying to figure out how this can happen. 
and you can only do it with design. That's right. That's why the shell is a different topic. It has a very precise way of doing that using genetic code and ribosomes, et cetera, et cetera. It's not the way one could do this uh, in nature. Yeah. It involves very, very complex um, equipment that's not available in nature. Exactly. I mean, the fifth point, uh, fifth point are that the particular sequence of different amino acids that form together has to be sequences that actually end up doing anything useful. Uh, you can't just have a whole bunch of random amino acids coming together and then all of a sudden, you know, you've got something that's lifelike. The problem is the vast, vast, vast majority of sequences are, are, are garbage and would just uh, dilute the minuscule amount that would be needed to do something useful. So you need something that precisely determines the right sequence of amino acids. Yeah. You know, Dr. Truman, this reminds me of how evolutionary biologists will try to appeal to harmful mutations somehow overcoming the alleged rare beneficial mutation that may occur. It's like it's it's all buried in the noise. John Sanford's touched on this and Sal Cordova talked about it in a recent show. It sounds like it's the same thing. They've got the same problem right. and somehow they got to come up with a way where this can happen despite all the other things that can go against it. Without, of course, the involvement of intelligence and planning. Exactly. And that's exactly what the problem is. Yep. Let me explain a little bit what I meant and illustrate that the different requirements are incompatible. For example, let's say you want to form long peptides. Uh, you're a chemist, you know that this is a requirement for cells to, to exist, you've got to have protein. So how do you create long uh, peptides? Remember I, I said that uh, these amino acids don't want to link together because thermodynamically they go the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And they have a proportion of about one to a million at 25 degrees of the longer peptide by one amino acid then the next longest and the next longest. So you end up in no time with like only tiny, tiny peptides, right? So what do you do? Well, we know, we know as chemists, you know, we know these things that higher temperatures would favor uh, getting these reactions to occur. That's why you've got the hydrothermal events. The equilibrium position uh, is less unfavorable, so to speak, at a higher temperature and that's what they try to do to try to create some of these peptides. So you start off with a hopelessly high concentration of pure amino acids in experiments trying to get some of these uh, peptides to form. You know, you get up to about four. I mean, you're not getting hundreds, but you, you know, you'll get it. It's better than nothing, okay? You're getting a little of something. So what's the problem here? Raising the temperature is a good way compared to the um, the warm ocean scenario to get longer peptides. You're not going to get longer peptides forming by amino acids forming in the atmosphere and, and falling on ocean. It just isn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. But it will happen under higher temperatures. What's the problem? The higher the temperature, the faster the loss of L amino acid. It, the racemization is faster. So you oh, destroy. Wow. Yeah. So you, you destroy another requirement that is absolutely just as important. Yeah. You're, you're trying to solve one requirement and all, there's a whole bunch of others that it's just, it's doing the opposite. Incompatible. And, and it's, yeah. Precisely. Wow. Precisely. They do the opposite. That's the central point. There, We cannot find any consistent set of conditions that meets even some of the requirements. For example, what happens when you raise the temperature? Now, other uh, compounds can react at the higher temperature with those amino acids that could not have reacted at a lower temperature. It's like ah. at a high temperature, like almost anything goes. And uh, a very severe problem is that the amino acids themselves now decompose. If you combine amino acids together under high conditions simulating a hydrothermal vent, 
within seconds, you already see how they're de degrading. The amino acids, you see CO2 being formed. The amino acids themselves are being degraded. Yeah. So it, it's kind of like it, it's all, again, points back to engineering. You have these requirements. Right. So you require a certain step. Like we require, say, with our uh, SSD drives, they should behave at a certain, they should be able to process reads and writes at a certain speed to meet a certain requirement. Oh, by the way, we're not going to tell you that this particular design that we're doing, well, it explodes as soon as you turn the thing on. Right. So they've got these, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, w they cannot control the explosion that's occurring when they try to satisfy one requirement. And I'm sure Dr. Truman, I, I'm assuming the other requirements they try to satisfy then kill other requirements. Right. Exactly. So, so Dr. Truman, now I, I have a solution. Let's lower the temperature, right? <laughs> okay. Well, let's think about that. Lower the temperature would be a way some other people, and I see you've got some good chemistry genes in you that's, uh, that's very, very good, have used <laughs> to, to solve certain problems like, um, let's say somehow you had an excess of L amino acid and you want to slow down the rate of it interconverting to the D form. That would indeed be favored by lowering the temperature. <laughs> now you've got other problems. Now you don't get the condensation reaction occurring. First of all, it'd be too slow. And second, the equilibrium position is now very, very, very favored in the amino acid uh, part, uh, specifically. Amino acids are very, very soluble in water. And the, the bonds of water are stronger when it's cold. Under high temperature, the interactions are weaker. So by lowering the temperature, you're making it easier to destroy the long peptides because it would lead to stabler amino acids hmm. in cold water. Okay, yeah. then I have another solution. Right. I want to have a high temperature and a low temperature simultaneously. Right. Now you're am, thinking, you now I, you're predestined for a job in abiogenesis because this is exactly <laughs> right. Um, yeah. That's and, exactly the trick. Yeah, you and you know, to start it, thinking like a chemist instead of thinking as an as an atheist. Yeah, and you know, I look back to, you know, you referred to how they have the hydrothermal vents to try to solve one of these requirements. Well, then I hear the word hydro in there, which is water. I mean, that's a solvent. Yeah. So there's so yeah. many problems they have to try to get around. And just I wanted to mention this really quick. I was watching a YouTube video by Smokin' DeGrasse Tyson, and right. he said water's the key. And then he said asteroids brought bacteria to Earth from Mars. Mm. And because we have, guess what? We think we have water on Mars. So he put those two together and said that life came from Mars. <laughs> okay. That's the, their logic here. Dr. Truman, you're just shooting so many holes in, in really the foundation of all this stuff with, when you actually look at the chemistry, which is really a precise, a, a very distinct and tangible science where we actually can reproduce this stuff in the lab. We can do experiments yeah. instead of dealing in abstract fantasy. Right. I like the, from the, the preceding question, which is, do some of the work under high temperature and then quickly uh, transfer to a cold temperature. And that's exactly the name of the game. When people identify their requirements, what they do is they, they play uh, chemical tricks. Um, and indeed, in some of the experiments, that's exactly what's done. Because you know that amino acids are not stable at 350 degrees hydrothermal vent uh, temperature, what do you do? You heat the water under high pressure so that it really does get to 350 degrees. And then you ram into it pure high concentrated amino acid so that it's still intact. And for a few seconds, it starts to react and a little bit of the peptides form. So then the equipment is very carefully designed to create a flow and then it reaches a point where you freeze it instantly like hundreds of degrees lower to prevent any peptide forming from being degraded and then you pump it back in to the original chamber that's very hot, you recirculate it what you're doing is you are very cleverly 
concentrating the peptide in a manner to force a little bit more to be formed. That's all done, but there's a catch. Remember, I told you that the amino acids themselves are unstable at very high temperatures. Right. So this whole trick about recirculating back into the original chamber means at the same time that you are also degrading the peptide plus the amino acid needed to react. So let me see how clever you are, see if you really are a good candidate for this kind of chemistry. What should a chemist do now? We know that at the very high temperatures, you start off pumping amino acid into this high pressure container. Then you quickly freeze any peptide being formed and you recirculate it back again. And I'm saying, hey, you're off to a good start. You've got a good trick, but you got a problem. You're going to end up degrading more and more and more amino acid. This trick is not going to work forever. What do you do? You, oh. you loop it very, very fast and do many, 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 many. That's a start, but uh, that's not going to really solve the problem because um, the total amount of time in the high temperature chamber would still be the same. Uh, I would have to introduce some other chemical, perhaps. Perhaps. Or, or perhaps I need another mechanism. I need either another mechanism or another chemical. The mechanism. Yeah, you're, you're so close. Yeah, you need Here's another part do. of the infrastructure. Almost. Here's what you do. I mean, it's like so obvious, guys. Come on. You terminate the experiment as soon as you get in a little bit what you want. That's that simple. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. oh, wait yeah. a second. Well, though. that's part of the infrastructure. You have a uh, you have a stop okay. sequence. Okay. Okay. Uh, guys, I'm dead serious. <laughs> I'm dead. I could not be. I could not be more serious. In any origin of life paper dealing with chemistry, always look at the duration, the duration experiments. Hmm. Yep. Why was this experiment terminated after 32 seconds? Ah. <laughs> Why did it go on? Why did it go on for 24 hours or three weeks? Always look at the time because what they're doing is they're using chemical principles, kinetic thermodynamics to get the outcome they want and then quickly preventing it from destroying itself. Oh, oh wow. That's a quite a sleight of hand. Yeah. This this is exactly uh what's going on. Uh, I'm showing I'm showing the slide here at the bottom. I'm showing you uh a curve. Right, right. Before a paper is published, ye typically years of experimentation has, has gone on. They looked at the right temperatures, any catalyst, any solvents, pressures, pH, whatever, until they finally come up with something that they think is not laughable. Hmm. And then they're saying, okay, and now we've got a 0.01% yield, but then look at how that was done. They are providing it at the optimal set of conditions. Yeah. But if you were, if this was realistic, and was being run on, in nature under normal conditions, it would self-destruct. Yes. But you, you but, just leave that part out of the paper? No. Um, you've got to read the section, uh, the experimental section or the addendums. Oh, so it's actually in there somewhere. You just have to dig and look for if it? Not, then, then any, then if, if not, then any chemist can figure it out on his own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is that is one of my pet peeves in this whole research. I think that Christians should also be involved in this kind of research because it allows us to identify the limits of how some of these five um, constraints can be met. Meaning, what is the longest peptide conceivable that could be formed? Or how could you best prevent racemization or... What are the best ways to chemically modify the side groups to prevent them from reacting? This is another trick. So we need a you form of, time. yeah, we need like a Mendel's accountant, uh, but for this chemistry, abiogenesis stuff. Because, uh, you know, Mendel's accountant showed that it was impossible to have evolution occur with the rate of the mutations were occurring. You can't get anything. It's all buried in the noise. So here, if you let the experiment actually run longer, 
which is what life would do realistically. It's not just going to stop. And if it did stop, then that implies there's some design mechanism of some sort. I mean, that's, like, that's a great point. That's a great point because in ma many times, and I've, I've sometimes written to some of these authors, I have said, okay, you admit that these particular laboratory conditions are not realistic, okay? But you have reported an outcome which is interesting. Why don't we now conduct some more experiments in the direction of what would be naturally more realistic and uh, see what happens? For example, when you start off with amino acids that are a billion times more concentrated that could possibly have been found anywhere on Earth, you will get, you know, a little bit of what you want to get, right? And what I'm saying is, okay, that's interesting. Um, I'm not asking you to do really, 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 really dilute experiments because, you know, we'll spend a whole life and never see anything, but do some experiments in the direction that will allow us to extrapolate, okay? Instead of using a 10 molar concentration of your starting material, do a one molar, do a one tenth of a molar, and then we can see the exponential uh, trend. And that would be a way to legitimately use these experiments to come up with a valid conclusion. So how do they respond to your emails to them on this? Not a, not a lot really respond. Um, a lot of them just have to get publications out of any cost. And mm -hmm. uh, they're not really interested in, in criticism. Experiments are expensive. And uh, if they are polite in a good mood, the reaction is usually, well, don't take it so seriously. Right, like, <laughs> well, wait, but wait a second. Good idea. It, yeah. Come on, we're chemists. We're chemists. But, we know we can exaggerate a little bit. You know, got to add a little bit of interest. I mean, I mean, I mean, <laughs> and all the same. Look, until I did my work, we thought there was no possibility at all to show this particular effect. At least I'm showing that there is, you know, there's an effect. I mean, that's interesting, right? <laughs> well, that's but, 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 if you if you put all your energy and all this money and time into the experiment and getting the publication, wouldn't validation be the next logical thing that you would want to advance your own prestige and your own career? Validation, but last week I made a point uh, that What's happening here is all of the obvious and easy experiments have been or are being done, and it's not showing anything near uh, what needs to be shown for the infrastructure to be created. So it's not true that progress has been made and we're starting to see the glimmers of, you know, how this could have all come together. What's happening instead is we're running out of ideas. Uh, if it takes If it takes you that much effort under these hopelessly implausible conditions to come up with a peptide that's 10 long, that is the concentration of one grain of sand in all the deserts of the world, is that, that dilute. Hmm. If it took you that much effort to do that, then we know it's not, there's no point in continuing. Yeah, exactly. If you're putting that much intelligence just to get that one grain of sand a speck of what you think is plausible evidence. You know, what's the, <laughs> you haven't well, really you know shown what? anything. You're you showing you're... that you need a lot of intelligence to even get to that one grain of sand. Yes. And, and you're describing the activities of prestidigitation. The magician doesn't need to carry it beyond the illusion. He's allowed to stop at the point that he's tricked you. Because then that, that's the whole point, is the tricking you. It's not the actual doing of the thing, right? I, I very much have sometimes this feeling, I don't want to use the word dishonesty, because, because those in the field know these things. It's not like they're deceiving anybody else who knows how to read the literature. Mm -hmm. It's the people that read the exaggerated abstracts or some of the kind of wild statement here or there and run with it. Yeah. And then and, uh, they extrapolate, embellish it, throw in a bunch of technical words, pretend they understood something. And this is what the average person actually encounters. The average guy on the street who has little interest in science, he's not reading these chemistry papers. 
No, he's encountering what Doug mentioned before the Facebook feed, you know, something that pops up on the Instagram or whatever social media. The YouTube, the YouTube uh, yeah. story, the narrative. Yeah. The smoking the grass uh, Tyson okay. YouTube videos. Right. So may, maybe, maybe since we don't want to drag this on too much, um, I just want to share maybe one uh, general thought, and that is to put in perspective uh, the power, the influence that intelligence can can uh, bring to accomplish an outcome, and then compare that to what natural processes uh, can do. Chemistry is an old science. We've been around for hundreds of years and learned an awful lot of very, very fundamental principles. And we can make chemicals do incredible things, okay? Any kind of a plastic, any kind of an artifact that you look around, all kinds of fuels, it's all chemistry, right? For example, a chemist could invent a secret code and they could agree that a particular amino acid stands for a letter. And by creating a peptide with a certain sequence could, cre could literally represent a message in English. He could agree to this somebody else. He could actually create a machine where he could type a message in English and it would mm -hmm. sequence that particular protein. He could send that to somebody in Singapore and that guy could read his code. A chemist can do this, literally. Yep. No problem. Wow. Which kind of reminds a little bit about, you know, DNA and codes. Exactly. Uh, but, we, yeah. How we you can, can be... Create yeah, the computer science connection with chemistry, really. Right. In a sense. We can yep. do things like that. So when we say that chemists, Nobel Prize winning chemists, have devoted their careers looking and trying to get the infrastructure necessary for cells to work to arise in some sort of plausible, natural way, when this level of intelligence and know how is producing the disappointing results that we're seeing today, it's hard for a non-chemist to put that in perspective. And I want to mm -hmm. share with you just one last slide, one last thought here to try to make you understand just how much a chemist can really do with this know-how to, to give you a feel for the level of failure that this abiogenesis type research is now facing. Let me give you, let me give you an example. You know the famous story about a tornado hitting a junkyard and creating a Boeing 747, right? And yes, yep, that's one of my bit. favorites. So that's, that's a good one. Now, let's just say that uh, an alien uh, were to visit the Earth and then come back a thousand years later and discover in a junkyard uh, an airplane that was not there before. It's fully fueled and, and could fly. Here's my question to you. What is more plausible that the alien comes back after a thousand years and sees an airplane sitting there or after a million years? What what would be more plausible for the alien who thinks this could have arisen by chance? One thousand years or one million years? What's the intuition there? Well, I think yeah, the, the natural intuition of most people because of the way we've been educated is what's well, more likely in a million years. Okay, let's think about that. Let's say that um, I put an airplane in a junkyard today. If I come back in 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years, would I, ex would I expect to find that fully functional airplane intact after 10 years or after 1,000 years? Well, no, no. The more time that goes by, the, the less functional it would be. Exactly. It's a natural process. Yeah. And that is that is the first uh, misconception that time is just automatically. I mean, you can throw in any word you want about natural selection and adaptability and any fancy words that have no chemical meaning at all, and pretend that time is somehow going to create, you know, a better helicopter or airplane. Oh, uh -huh. uh -huh. yep. See, and that is that is not the way chemistry works. And maybe I've given a little bit of inclination of, of intuition from my examples of the requirements that chemicals have to meet. That time is not going to help you. Any yeah, time. Yeah, time's time an under enemy. hydrothermal vent is not going to create a longer peptide. Yeah, time's an enemy. To, an enemy. It's a yeah. 
That's why they cut off their experiments. Like you said, right. you you dig through those papers and there's a duration that they use. They don't go past a certain duration. So that's correct. So a chemist, a chemist, knowing everything we know about chemical tricks and processes and mechanisms, could build just about anything using earth, water, air, and fire, literally, just about anything. I mean, I work at a, I worked 40 years, the world's largest chemical firm. In our main site, we have hundreds of plants together. We literally have a plant that takes molecules out of the air, CO2 hmm. and stuff, hydrogen, and this gets processed, passed on to another plant. It gets processed, transformed, combined. It gets uh, passed on to another one, and we end up with toys and stuff like that. So we, <laughs> this, this may sound insane to you, but if you put together a lot of chemists that are motivated enough, you could literally create a radar and invisible jet plane out of thin air. I believe you're right. Yeah, yeah. And it's all under, you know, directed engineering. It, exactly. That's you, the you, key. You, you, you bring the components together, the simple components, you transform them using mechanisms that you know add temperature at the right time, the right catalyst, the right conditions, anything else. And step by step by step, you get your one. Now, suppose you try to create something like a seed. You know, a tree seed, you see it, you look at it, you can analyze it, you do spectroscopy uh, studies on it. How difficult would it be to retroengineer just one simple seed? Well, uh, I mean, when you say it like that, it sounds like it shouldn't be that difficult. But I'm going to insist that you don't, that you limit your components to only non-biotic components. It cannot be components that you've got from another seed or from another living organism. You are limited to, let's just say, water, fire, uh, air. You're limited to natural Yeah, you can't, uh, you, you can't okay. appeal to the Green Deal guy, the green okay. alien. <laughs> no, well, no, well, yeah. Okay. You can use <laughs> chemistry. You can use chemicals. Okay, well, now wait a second, though, because... That seed came from nothing but air and earth and water. So, yeah, we should be able to do that. It shouldn't be too tough. <laughs> that would be the theory, wouldn't it? You, you think the yeah. problem is right. we know it's not true uh, because for a seed to work, it's not enough. Even if you could build all the chemical infrastructure and dump it together in a flask and shake it around a little bit, you're not going to get a seed because... <laughs> The incredible thing about a seed is that it is a, a dynamic system with many interacting parts that have got to be functional of initial. That means you, you can't just, first of all, you can't create the components like DNA and stuff because all the things I mentioned, the DL problem, the lung polymer problem, the side chain problem, all these problems you've got with also with DNA and RNA, that's bad enough. Yep. So you can't create these things naturally, but if you could put them together, the problem is these things interact in a cell. That means you've got DNA that's replicated by proteins. Proteins are uh, translated by enzymes that must already exist with ATP that must already exist using messages from DNA, which must already exist which must create the RNA, which can only occur if, you know, the, the transcription uh, can occur. All these things are interdependent. Yes, interdependent. Yep. And interdependent. So, so it seems that the, to assume that the seed should be able to be made, you just have to assume intelligence. That That's right. the assumption. And if you but, don't, and so if you, re, if you refuse to appeal to intelligence to design meaning god what do you end up appealing to you end up appealing to magic what Ca chaos yeah, yeah magic Destruction. yeah fantasy. no no well, magic, magic okay yeah it's magic, magic fantasy first. yeah magic it's first. Fantasy. magic yeah right right so yeah. and, 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 of course 
Yeah, God's now, at, invisible attributes are clearly seen by the things that he has made so that man is without excuse. Exactly. It, yes, amen. And I, I just want to let people know, if you appeal to magic long enough, you end up appealing to uh, insanity. That leads to insanity, which leads to destruction, which, which leads to death. You can't appeal to fantasy. That's not allowed. Not in chemistry. Yep. Well, Dr. Truman, we're actually out of time. And wow, what a wonderful way to sum up this whole problem with abiogenesis. Uh, any closing thoughts, Dr. Truman? And I you know, really want to thank you for joining us and your expertise and going through this. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, Doug and I learn a lot of stuff every time we have great guests like you on the show. Amen. Hey, and Fred actually nailed abiogenesis. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, well, next show, I'm sure I'll say Abby O. Genesis. You know, my daughter's name, Abby, so I, I get a free pass there, I think. So <laughs> so any closing Dr. thoughts, Truman, that, Dr. That Truman? Was just, that, well, that was truly maybe the, the one thought I have is that if, if anybody who had no concept of God or atheism or anything had the intelligence and landed on Earth, if they had any chemical uh, training, it would never occur to them that this had arisen on its own. Yeah, that, that train, that plane in the junkyard wasn't uh, yeah. by a tornado. Yeah. Okay. Well, Dr. Truman, thanks again. And I wanted to remind our audience that we've teamed up with Colorado Right to Life. They've got a really great program going on right now where they are funding billboards in the state, you know, warning people who drive to Colorado about the destruction of abortion. It really reaches these people because, and it's shown to have a positive effect because Colorado has become a destination state for abortion. Uh, because of the liberal policies of our state. So if you really want to make an impact on saving lives, please go visit Colorado Right to Life. That's CRTL.org. So for Doug McBurney and Dr. Royal Truman, I'm Fred Williams of Real Science Radio. May God bless you. <laughs>